some developers think that there is a grand battle occurring, a conflict between two forces. The reality is that HTML5 and native development methodologies can be complementary. They don't have to be at odds. You can use HTML in a native app with great effect to create really great user experiences. So we're going to start by reframing the debate. It's not a battle to the death. It's about using the right tool for the right job. When you use HTML5 in an appropriate context in ways that it's intended to be used, it's a very powerful tool. So let's start by talking about the advantages of HTML development. It makes it very easy to express high-level design concepts with declarative markup. You get a lot of control over the style and appearance. You can use cascading style sheets to, to add effects like gradients and shadows and transparency, even animation. Uh, vendor neutral open standards make so that HTML technology is relatively pervasive, supported across many different kinds of devices. There's a lot of portability. Uh, it's all, HTML is also very easy to learn and use, and it's very conducive to rapid prototyping. You can get uh, a new project up and running very quickly without a lot of effort. Uh, now, although HTML has many advantages, there are also a lot of disadvantages. There's not a whole lot of consistency between different rendering engines. Uh, in fact, there's a great deal of fragmentation. And th this is a problem that happens to be a lot worse on mobile devices than it is on the desktop. You know, on the desktop, the, uh, the main browser vendors are pushing these updates very quickly. They're getting new versions out with these new capabilities on a very regular cycle. But on mobile devices, you just don't have that to the same extent. I mean, consider Android, for example, where uh, you know, a device manufacturer might give an, a, a device a single update during its entire two-year lifespan, three-year lifespan. Um, they're not pushing new versions of the HTML rendering engine. So there's a lot of fragmentation. If you go back and you look at Android 2.3, which is still like 40% of Android handsets, um, they're missing some critical features in the built-in HTML rendering engine, um, features like web workers, for example, which allow you to do threading. So, you know, the fragmentation poses a lot of challenges for HTML mobile development. Um, it's also really hard to get great performance and acceptable responsiveness. You know, you know, you want a great user experience where everything is really fast and smooth. And HTML, there are some challenges to doing that, especially when you move beyond using HTML for content and try to use it for a more application-like experience, something where you've got a list view, a scrolling list view, for example. Um, so this is a, an issue that Facebook ran into with their app. They had a complex scrolling list view. They were doing all of that work with HTML. And in order to keep the memory footprint down, you need to be able to remove items off the top of that list as you're adding them to the bottom. But when you do that with HTML, you have this complex rendering engine. So when you're pulling stuff off the top and adding it to the bottom, the layout engine has to reflow the whole page every time you're doing these kinds of operations. That can get very computationally intensive. And so Facebook hit this brick wall where they found that they just weren't able to get the kind of performance they wanted out of a scrolling list view in HTML. And when they migrated their app over to using native controls for that list view, they, they found that in user engagement increased significantly. So that's, that's really a challenge with HTML5. You, you have to be able to get performance, and you, ha you can't use it in ways that are going to compromise that. So you know, another, another issue is a lack of native controls. When you're using HTML5, you get very, very rich, expressive tools for creating a distinctive design. But it, it's, really, it's really not going to match the look and feel of your underlying platform. You don't get that the kind of native look and feel that you get when you're using standard controls. And this goes, this goes much deeper than just like the aesthetics, because when you're, when you're, even if you're building like a custom style on a mobile app, like consider RDO, which is a you know, beautiful app with a you know, custom branded appearance on all platforms, they're still building it on top of native controls. Uh, and that, that makes it so that the, the behaviors and, and the responsiveness and everything, is still, it still matches what the user would expect from their platform. Um, so that's, that's a huge issue right there. And so that, that brings us to the last point, which is that HTML rendering engines are really confining you to this like lowest common denominator kind of experience. You're not, you can't leverage any of the unique platform specific functionality because it, it's designed to work everywhere. So you can only get the features that are designed to work everywhere. And so you, you get an experience that kind of looks alien everywhere. So I'd like to tell you a story. Um, this is a, a news article that I read recently. Um, 
this guy goes to a market and he, he thinks he's buying toy poodles, which, you know, purebred toy poodle is it's a very expensive animal, and so he thinks he's getting this great deal. And it turns out that what he got was not a toy poodle. It was a ferret on steroids that had been groomed to look like a poodle. So <laughs> when I saw this article, um, I, I, just, I just couldn't help it. I said, this, this has to go in my presentation for Evolve because this, this is the perfect analogy. When you give your users a like egregiously non-native user experience, that, that's what you're doing. It's like passing off a, a ferret on steroids as a toy poodle. And you know, your users deserve better. They expect better. So, and it's also not fair to the, the ferret, right? So I, I thought that this was a, a great analogy to include in my talk here. You, you want to make sure that you're giving your users what they expect, the real deal, the, the real high quality native user experience that they really want to have on their device. And when you use HTML to create kind of that application-like experience and it falls short, you're robbing them of that experience. So I think that that's, that's a huge, important thing to understand. And you know, like, like I said, you know, this being unfair to the ferret, you know, ferrets are awesome. They're, they're like the slinkies of the rodent world. They're very flexible, right? So ferrets are awesome at being ferrets. You want to let your ferret be a ferret. Um, so HTML, when, when you let it do what it's great at, it, it's, it's a fantastic tool. So I think that I'm going to try and show you guys here today uh, where HTML shines and how you can use it in a native Xamarin app to get a great user experience. So native development has a huge number of advantages, obviously. You can access the full range of device capabilities, platform-specific functionality, everything that the device has to offer. Uh, native controls supplied by the platform are just tailored to give you optimal performance. So you know, this gets back to the list view example that I was giving you guys earlier. Um, you know, when, when Facebook was trying to, to build that kind of pseudo list view thing with HTML, you know, they were running into those performance problems. But the, the native user interface toolkit is designed for the platform. It's built for exactly that kind of interaction. You know, it's, it's designed for cell reuse and all of that. So it, it, you're getting tons of platform level optimizations that are really tailored to giving you the best experience possible. And so you can get so much more performance that way. So the other key thing regarding performance is that using native code gives you a lot more room for optimization and parallelization. Um, so you know, on the HTML side, with web workers you know, becoming more pervasively supported, you, you can do some basic threading and stuff like that. But with C Sharp and Xamarin, I mean, you get P-Link, you get all of these fantastic tools that let you really take advantage of multi-core processors and next generation smartphones. So and finally, and this is really vital, you get perfect conformance with the standard user interface conventions of the native platform. Everything looks and feels native. It's not alien. It, it's something that, that your users will, will be delighted with because it's, it's what they expect and what they need. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about hybrid advantages. Now on this slide we have the Crocoduck. Uh, when I was showing these slides to my friend Joanne, who I work with at Xamarin, we were saying the Crocoduck isn't, isn't quite the right, the right image for this slide. It's, it's not majestic enough because when you've got a real high performance native app that uses HTML in just the right way, it, it, it's, a, it's a work of art, right? It's a thing of beauty. So what she suggested instead is, is the Pegacorn, which is a, a hybrid of Pegasus and Unicorn, right? So I, I was totally on board with that. I think the Pegacorn is the perfect analogy for that high quality native app. But unfortunately, I was not able to find any pictures of a Pegacorn in its natural habitat. So I, I stuck with the Crocoduck. Um, anyway, so <laughs> when you have a hybrid app, uh, there are a lot of advantages. You get to decide which parts of your application are going to be built with native technology and which parts are going to be built with HTML. And when, when you have that power to choose, when you have that flexibility, uh, it, it, just, it just makes it so that you can use everything in the right place. You know, HTML is so, so good for things like, like content display where you have a bunch of rich text and graphics and things where you need a lot of reflow and stuff. It, it, it's great for that. It's not great if you want to do like list views and you know, tab interaction and things like that. So with a hybrid app, you, you really get the, the, the freedom and the power to choose. Now another great advantage of a hybrid is that any of those underlying native platform capabilities that, that you can access with Xamarin, you can get in your HTML content. You can expose those underlying native platform capabilities and kind of bubble them up to your, your hybrid app into the HTML layer. I'm going to show you a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, 
So finally, the, 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 one of the biggest advantages of hybrid is that if at some point down the line in your project you hit this brick wall and you say HTML is just not cutting it, we need to go all native, then if you've started with a hybrid app, it's much easier to do that. You don't have to start from scratch. You're just replacing this HTML bits in your app and, and transitioning it over to a fully native experience. You know, whereas if you started with, with something like PhoneGap and you're building it all you know, up from HTML, you're, you're really going to have to start over. Um, so Xamarin has a lot to offer for hybrids. The, the you know, key advantage of Xamarin here is that you've got this great C-sharp development experience that works across all of these platforms. You can share all of the C-sharp code. So when you build a hybrid app with Xamarin, you can share all of your C-sharp code, all of your HTML, and all of your JavaScript. Um, there are, of course, platform-specific differences in how you facilitate communication between you know, HTML and C Sharp. So those things are going to have to be platform specific. And of course, any platform specific capabilities and, you know, things that are native user interface, you're going to have to do platform specific. But you can share a ton of code this way by building a, a hybrid app that uses C Sharp for your underlying data and native controls for your main user interface and then HTML for data presentation in certain contexts. Uh, you can use platform specific APIs and native user interface controls and HTML all at the same time. So we're going to talk a little bit about displaying content in native apps. The, uh, this is one of the big areas where HTML is a huge win. Uh, it's just so fantastic for, for any kind of rich text with interspersed graphics and things where you need everything to flow around, as I said. Um, and you can use responsive design techniques to make it so that that HTML content is always going to look right uh, regardless of how the user's device is oriented or what the screen size is or any of these other characteristics. It makes it really easy to adapt to those kinds of changes. Um, in the mono stack, we have this great technology called Razor that came from ASP.NET. And uh, is anybody here familiar with Razor? We got some? That's great. So Razor is a templating engine. And in ASP.NET, you typically use Razor to define like this template where you're, you have your HTML content and you have data interspersed with it. So if you have like a, a data model and you want to you want to display it in HTML, it, it's useful for that that kind of operation. Now we don't obviously don't want the whole ASP.NET stack on a, on a mobile device, right? But with uh, Xamarin, you can you can use a Razor template by itself for HTML generation on an iOS or Android application. And that's what I'm going to show you here today. Uh, I have a demo called Razordex. So I wanted to build a real world application. And um, this is perhaps not real world, but it was fun, so I did it anyway. Uh, and it is a Pokédex. So for those of you who don't know Pokémon, there are hundreds of these creatures. And uh, you go through the game and you catalog them and whatnot. So this application is a Pokemon catalog. I have a little SQLite database embedded in the application with all of this information about all the Pokemon. And so on, on the, you know, this side of the, uh, the screen here, you can see that we've got this native con list control. It's fully native. It has the names of all the Pokemon. And it's displaying them in you know, a fully native list that you can flick through really fast. It's really smooth. It's really native. So then on the other side, you can see that we have the detail view. When you tap one of the Pokemon in that list, it displays this you know, nice, pretty layout with all of the, the details about the Pokemon. So that detail view is HTML. It's, it's literally like a UI web view, uh, iOS UI web view that's embedded you know, in that, that master detail view. And in that UI web view, we're putting HTML content that we've generated with a Razor template using data that's pulled from a SQLite database. So, when I was implementing Razordex, uh, you can see here that it's actually pretty simple. Uh, we have the, uh, the Razor template, which is, you know, it looks like pretty much straightforward HTML, right? So we were using cascading style sheets. Um, that was how we did the, the gradients and the inner shadows and some of the things you saw in that last screenshot. Uh, and we have the, this model specified at the top. So that model line, it, it specifies the type that we're using for the data model. And you can see on the other side here, we have this Pokemon class. And this Pokemon class, all of that data is pulled from a SQLite database. So I'm using a framework called SQLite Net, which is an ultra lightweight object relational mapping system. It's just very, very light, very simple. What it does is it allows you to define a class like this where all of these properties are like fields in your database table. And then when you pull stuff out of the database, it'll just 
populate those, those properties with the, the data from the relevant fields. So there's very little glue involved you know, in, in getting data out of the SQLite database. Uh, and then what, I'm, what we're doing is we're passing this Pokemon object into the Razor template, template engine so we can generate HTML from the template. Uh, and you can see here we have the, uh, the specific code, grab my mic, the uh, specific code that's used to implement it. Uh, we're just creating a, a template. So when, when you create this Razor template in, in uh, Xamarin Studio, uh, you'll, you'll give it a name. And the name here was you know, Pokemon HTML view. And when you save it, you know, when, you when you build your app, it'll, it'll generate like a code behind thing with, uh, with C-sharp code for doing all of the, the processing on the template. It's like a pre-compiled Razor template. So you can instantiate the view right here in your code uh, and then pass in as the, uh, the, the model value uh, whatever data you want to give it. So this is just an instance of the Pokemon class here. Um, in, your, in our master detail uh, application, we, we basically make it so that when you tap that list item, you can take that detail item and pass it in with all the Pokemon data. And that's, that's how it generates the HTML. So it's taking the, uh, the, the, the model and it's taking the you know, primary type of the Pokemon and the you know, Pokemon's secondary type. And it's just taking these values right out of the, uh, the, uh, the instance of the Pokemon class here. So then what we need to do is load it into the UI web view as HTML. And we're generating that HTML with Razor. So it's, it's very straightforward. Um, it's very fast. Um, and UI web view basically just gives you this method that you can take a HTML string, raw HTML string, dump it into the UI web view, and then it'll render and display like you would expect. So that's, that's really all we're doing. Now, the, the, uh, the, the last parameter here, you can see we have this uh, nsbundle.mainbundle.bundle URL. Uh, when, you, when you put a, a HTML string into a UI web view, uh, you need to specify like, what the base path is so that any relative paths in the HTML will be resolved correctly. So if you look in the Razor template, you can see that we have the style.css defined here. And it's just a you know, relative, relative path. So we, we have a, a cascading style sheet that is in the uh, resource bundle. And you know, it's embedded in the application. And by using the, uh, you know, the, this nsbundle.mainbundle.bundle URL value as the, uh, the base path, it makes it so that anything that's in your resources will just be accessible to the HTML via a relative URL. So, I mean, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is as simple as it gets. And it makes it really easy to do this kind of presentation. And if you were trying to present that Pokemon data with native controls, it'd probably take a little more time. It'd be a little more finicky. You wouldn't be able to do like nice formatting uh, quite as easily. Um, and so, you know, here, this is a perfect case where you can use HTML, get all of those advantages of, you know, easy development and nice look and feel, but you're not degrading the quality of the application. Because we're not even, we're not even like maintaining this, this pretense you know, that, that these are native controls or anything. It's just data that we're displaying. So it's not like tricking the user into thinking, well, this is like a UI element. This is a list view or anything. It just, it's just data. So you know, that's, that really gives you a great experience when you do that approach. And so I like to say that no ferrets were harmed in the making of this app. OK, so um, now we're going to talk briefly about uh, hybrid communication techniques, uh, how you can facilitate communication between the uh, HTML and native layers of your application. Uh, and there are different ways to do this in different environments. Um, some of these, most of these are going to be uh, Android examples, but many of them are also going to be applicable. So this first example, uh, what I'm showing you here is Android specific. This one will not work on iOS, but it's, um, it's a technique where you can take uh, a class from, from C Sharp and expose it directly to the JavaScript layer, uh, making it so that JavaScript can call into your C Sharp code. Um, and basically, if you look at the, the top line here, this is the HTML that you would have in your, in your web content. Um, you can see we've created a simple div with uh, an on click routine here that just calls this foo.bar JavaScript function. And when that function is called, Android is going to display like a little pop-up notification toaster. It was just a you know, simple example here. Um, so to do this, you have to inherit JavaLang object. And that's one of the weird quirks about this. Um, so this is like part of the Android uh, WebView APIs. They support exposing Java objects into HTML and JavaScript. 
Um, but it, it's designed to work like with their, their binding layer. So you have to uh, inherit from Java Lang object explicitly in order to do this with Xamarin. Um, but once you've done that, you can just use this export uh, attribute to specify what you want the function to be exposed as in JavaScript. Uh, and that's, that's how you know, foo.bar calls, uh, you know, calls this method. So now down here we have this add JavaScript interface method where we're just taking our web view uh, and we're taking an instance of the foo class and we're adding it as foo. So that's, that's how it can call in. And then you just load your HTML in. So that when you do this, uh, you can really use any JavaScript code you want that just calls right into the, uh, the, the C Sharp functions. This one is Android specific. There's unfortunately no equivalent capability on iOS uh, that's, that's, you know, quite, that works quite that way. Now, an another approach is to intercept a link handler. So say that you want to have somebody click something in, in the HTML and you want to intercept that action so that you can have your C Sharp code perform an operation of some kind. Um, that's what we're demoing here. This code is, again, Android, but this is not platform specific. You can adapt this technique and there's an equivalent way that's relatively straightforward to do it on iOS as well. So uh, if you look at the, uh, the top line, that's the HTML that we have in our web view. Uh, it's just a simple anchor tag, but in the href, instead of a URL, we have this weird line, message colon, this is a test. And what we're doing there is we're just creating our own custom like quasi URL protocol. And it's not something that's supported at the platform level. We don't need to implement pro you know, protocol support for that at the platform level. But what we're, what we're doing here is just intercepting the click and then we're gonna use that as a way to detect when, when that kind of link was clicked. So uh, what we have is a custom uh, subclass of a web view client and we're overriding the should override URL loading method. And this method, every time anybody clicks an anchor or anything that's like a link in the HTML, it, it's going to call this method and give us the option of intercepting the operation and replacing it with you know, something that we want to do ourselves instead of letting it just load uh, like it normally would. So when the user clicks that anchor tag uh, this, and this method gets called, we have this, this simple check to say, does that URL start with message colon? And if it does, then we're going to handle it. And if it doesn't, then we're not going to handle it. If, it's, if it doesn't start with message colon, then we're just going to let the, uh, the web view do its own thing and load it. But if it does, then we're going to intercept it. We're going to parse it. We're going to split the, uh, the string and then take everything after the colon and then display it in a toast. So this is a you know, fairly simple way to intercept link clicks and um, have a custom handler that, that creates your own behavior. And th this is a good way to do it across platforms. Um, the, the iOS approach, this isn't exactly the same, but it's, it's close enough that, that it's, it's fairly trivial to support this. Um, so now, finally, uh, another thing that's really important is being able to call JavaScript from C Sharp. So you have JavaScript functions that you've defined in your HTML content, and you want to be able to call those from your native code. Uh, that's a really important thing to be able to do. And, um, in order to do that, you can just use uh, this load URL method on the web view. You can create like a, a JavaScript URL. So you know in, in a web browser, when you, you go into the URL bar and you type JavaScript colon, you type a JavaScript expression, it'll basically evaluate it. You can do like an alert or whatever. Um, that's really, we're using the same underlying mechanism to call JavaScript in the context of the web view from C Sharp. Um, so in this, this example is fairly trivial. You have an Android application with a button. You find the button. We're adding a click handler. And when that button is clicked in the native code, or in the native user interface, it's telling the, uh, the web view that we're going to uh, get a certain element and um, change the inner HTML value. So you can do you know, arbitrarily complex JavaScript expressions, or you can just call functions, or what have you. Uh, and this is a really great technique for, for doing like transformations to the page. So you can define a bunch of JavaScript functions that say like, we'll collapse or expand this or we'll animate that. And then you can use this to make it so that when you hit something in your native, native UI controls, it calls into the web, the web view and has those operations take place. Okay, so uh, now we've got a little bit of time for QA if anybody has uh, any questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, so you could, you could, I guess, put, right, okay, well, fancy, yeah. I mean, you could, that's, so there's not really a trivial way that I'm aware of, but you could put, you could have the, the function put a value somewhere in the DOM and then you could extract it out or, yeah. Um, and then I think I might have missed something. When you were showing us um, the, that first example where you had the razor content and then you were, um, you instantiated a class, where did that class come from? So it, it's generated from the, the razor template. When, when you create the, the razor template in, in um, Xamarin Studio, you'll get like a CSHTML file. And then during compile time, that CSHTML file will be pre-compiled down to C Sharp code and it'll generate that underlying class that you can, that you can use in your application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which of the last slides were Android specific? Oh, so um, those were all Android examples, but the only one that you can only do on Android is the one where you have a, a C Sharp object that you're exposing directly to JavaScript. That's that one you can, as far as I know, can only do on Android. Can you intercept a uh, post, like the poop form data? Yeah, so you can intercept all kinds of things. It, it really, I mean, it, the APIs are slightly different across different platforms, but um, you, if you dig deeper in, there are ways to override other kinds of network operation handlers. So the, this is really the, the easiest way to, to intercept a click was with that particular method. But yeah, there are, there are other, other methods you can use to intercept if you look at the APIs. Um, that, is, did, that does differ between the platforms. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add that I have a library on GitHub called JS uh, Bridge for iOS that allows you to pass um, JSON like back and forth. So it's a lot easier. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention too, in Android you can add a JavaScript interface and then you can call your app back from JavaScript. So you can do a callback that way to get some values back if you're calling JavaScript. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a performance, right? Is it? Can't see any difference from native in terms of rendering the views. Is there anything to and is there anything to avoid? Is there any glitches? So it, it depends a lot on what you're doing. Um, and you know, again, like when you're just displaying content, you know, as was the case in the Razor Dex demo, um, you, you're not going to lose any performance. Razor is pretty fast at generating that HTML in general, uh, and then there's nothing about that HTML that would really hit the performance, but. Uh, if you have like a lot of complex animations, or if you have you know custom scrolling that you're trying to implement, like jQuery mobile type things, you start to get heavier and heavier, and that's that's really where you start to see the performance hit. But it, again, it depends a lot on the platform and the device. One of the the real pitfalls, especially on Android, is that device performance varies so greatly. You know, the HTML rendering engine, the way that it's it's displaying that content, it, it really is going to vary a lot from device to device. And we've even seen this strange phenomenon where like um, different, different devices with the same version of Android but from different manufacturers have slightly different WebKit builds. And so you get these kind of weird performance deltas when you start to, to get into deep water. I guess that's, that's what I would say. Hmm? Yeah, um, particularly uh, because there are a lot of features that aren't supported in older versions. And uh, the, the best place to go to get information on that is uh, caniuse.com, uh, which has very detailed tables that show you all of these HTML5 features and where they're supported and what platforms allow them. So on Android, it's a little complicated because the, the, the platform essentially has its own browser and then there's Chrome. And the Chrome for Android is a much, much better HTML rendering engine than the platform's built-in HTML renderer. And if you're doing a hybrid app, you're embedding essentially the platform's native HTML renderer, which is quite a bit further behind. They're working on making it so you can embed the Chrome HTML renderer, but it's, it's going to be a while before they get there. And you know, uh, Android 2.3 is just missing a ton of stuff. So you, you really have to look at the list to see exactly what. Mm -hmm. So the web view that comes with the platform has a lot of advantages in terms of integration, like scrolling behavior and all this other stuff that it just works. Um, but on Android, you theoretically could embed your own HTML renderer if you wanted to. Uh, I imagine that there'd be a lot of um, like storage overhead that would like, make your package very large. But uh, it's worth noting, for example, that Mozilla has been working on bringing uh, you know, its, its Firefox browser to Android, and they've done a very nice job of that. 
and they're working on making a, a set of tools that you can build like HTML apps against the Firefox HTML renderer on Android, which would be a much better experience than the current native rendering engine. Mm -hmm. could, could you start up an async and then have the, like, through JavaScript, pass data to the page and have it refreshed so that you get a uh, real-time refresh on data that's being rendered in the HTML? Um, like communicating from HTML to native and have it like, or like have it so that when an async operation finishes, it injects something into the page or? Well, so you show an HTML page that is rendered in the browser and then you show it up to the real browser page. Yeah, okay, so like without having to refresh, reload the whole HTML, is that what you're asking? Yeah, okay, so that, that example that I showed at the end where um, you're using your, oh, let me see here if I can. Yeah. So if you if you look here, that's that's exactly what this is doing. Is it's taking uh, get element by ID and it's changing the HTML. So you can use this JavaScript calling technique to modify things that are in the page. And that's what this is doing. It's just taking the word hello and it's putting it in, in an arbitrary page element. So you could have this be like you know after an async operation, you do this and you're just changing the, the HTML content however you want to change it. And you can you can grab any class or ID out of the page and change its inner HTML value to replace its content with something else. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, the, the wizard template will be compelled, but does that mean we cannot load the template at a runtime dynamically? Okay, so it, it, it's basically like pre-compiling the template down to, to C-sharp code, so you, you can't like modify or generate the template at runtime, but the content that the template is generating is all generated at runtime, if that makes sense. So I guess uh, if we have a template uh, on the device already and we want to update that template, there's... You'd have to rebuild your app to change the template itself. But to change the content that emits, the template emits, that's all dynamic, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, if you're doing this within iOS, does the embedded web menu there give you access to the higher performance JavaScript engine? No. Okay, that's, that's another issue. The, um, uh, so one of the things that Apple has done on iOS is they, they've disabled the JIT, uh, just-in-time compilation for their JavaScript runtime uh, for third-party apps. Um, it's only available in their web browser, and this is ostensibly done as a security measure um, because the, they, they didn't want, you know, runtime code generation, essentially. Um, and, yeah, they, they, the, when you're doing this kind of hybrid app, uh, you do not get full access to the, the JavaScript JIT on iOS. They, they still disable it. Mm -hmm. It's a good question, thanks. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. So the web view is thread set. You can modify the DOM from different threads. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I haven't really gotten into that. Um, I'd have to look at that more. Also, the call gets serialized back into the main web view thread. So, like, if you're going to do anything where you invoke inside, that's all running in the main web view thread. So, like, you may think it's running from another thread, but it's going to actually proxy it into the main web view thread. Yeah, I would imagine, like, when you're when you're using, you know, like this technique to, you know, to call into it, that would be the case. But when when you're using like the Android mechanism where you're calling like native C sharp function from within, I I really don't know. Any plans for a Razor designer? I don't know about that either. Um, that would be cool, though. We we do we do have like the, the degree of Razor support that we have in Xamarin Studio today. We have like syntax highlighting and some auto completion and stuff like that. And um, you know, Michael Hutchinson did some cool stuff there. And my understanding is that they had a summer of code student who also did some work there. But uh, I don't know if that's if that's something that's going to see uh, a lot more work or not. Yeah. But you mean like interactive visual visual layout kind of thing or? Okay, yeah, I don't, I'm not aware. Mm -hmm. Can Razor, Razor, Razor template include other templates? Mm -hmm. Can you include other templates in one Razor engine? All of that? Can you include the template in the Razor template into other templates in Cascade? Is there support for partial VM? Oh, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, it Because it's a, like a static pre-compiled Razor template, I'm... I'm not sure how well that would work. I mean, you could, yeah, I, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Anything else? 
or yeah. we good? All right, thank you everybody.